Hello, hello. I've been meaning to film a Q&A about studying abroad, traveling, interrailing, all that stuff for the longest time. I have good tips and tricks. I've also just gotten so many questions about it, so I thought let's just answer them all in one video. Ow, did you hear that? Oh, I can finally breathe. This dress is the most beautiful, magnificent thing, but it is so friggin' tight. I don't know if I can wear this for the rest of the day. I think I might have to change. I was studying abroad, as you may or may not know, for the past seven months in Copenhagen. If you're new here and you have no idea like what I'm doing, basically I study at McGill in cultural studies, that's my major, and I minor in comms, which is basically studying how to criticize, analyze art, culture, media. I feel like that's kind of the gist of it, learning how to take in all the culture we encounter on a daily basis. It's such an awesome program. I learn about film. I learn about literature. I love McGill so much. A big thing for me going into university that I was so excited about was studying abroad. That was always something I really wanted to do. My mom studied abroad in France and university, learned French, which led her eventually to meet my dad, move to Montreal. Study abroad has always been something my parents have encouraged me to show interest in. Travel has always been a big thing in my family. We love to travel. I wanted to experience living abroad also i'm so greasy because i'm so sweaty new york is like the most humid place on earth right now honestly there was really no question in my mind that i was gonna go to mcgill if i stayed in montreal milo <laughs> McGill has the best exchange program. Lots of sister schools, so many options of where you can go to study. Okay, next question, what did you study abroad? So like I said, McGill, especially for liberal arts programs, has so many options of where you can go around the world. So where I went, there were a couple exchange programs that were meant only for exchange students to take. And so I took a Danish film and cinema course and a Danish architecture and design course. So. I always get so stressed that there's like someone's gonna like break in and just kidnap me so I think we're fine, that might be just Milo. Those were the two courses I took, very in line with my major and with my interests. Although to be honest, school was not the biggest thing where I went. School is extremely easy and I didn't do that much of it, but I was at University of Copenhagen. I feel like usually people go like CBS if they're in business and then University of Copenhagen for science and liberal arts. Super pretty campus, great teachers, chill classes. In both classes, the teachers were like, you can come to class or you cannot. It doesn't really matter. You can just read the slides, I think because classes are designed for exchange students and especially in Copenhagen there's this accent on exchange being meant I guess to explore the city and travel more than like go to class at least that's how I felt that's how I read it and that's how I went about my exchange school was definitely my last priority which is never the case really so it was nice to have that be the case for change because I've always been someone that's so like school oriented which is great I love studying I love learning I love going to school I love the structure that school brings into my life but I think there is an imbalance in my life when it comes to school whenever I'm in school and it counts, exchange didn't count, whenever it counts, it takes over my life and it's all I care about. And so exchange was really good for me in that sense. But anyways, we'll get to that a bit later. Let's move on. Okay, how did you decide study abroad was the right choice for you in your degree? Traveling, I think is integral to any degree. You just learn so much about yourself through traveling. And I think that you need that regardless of what you're studying in order to grow, yes, but also in order to build an understanding of how different countries and cultures function, especially being in cultural studies because in order to really learn the most about a culture immersing yourself in it in it is the best way so it was kind of obvious for my major that I would do exchange but like I said I feel like in any degree exchange is beneficial you're in school yes to learn about whatever it is you're majoring and minoring in but in university you're changing so much those years are so transformative and I think that there's so much to be learned outside of the classroom and that's something I firmly firmly believe I encourage everyone to do exchange it's truly the best experience I've ever had in my entire life it taught me so much about myself and I came home a changed person for the better in every single way, regardless of your degree, do it. It's also like the one time in your life, I mean, not the one time, but it's a really great opportunity to be in school without having school be like a huge thing, at least at McGill. Your grades didn't count, really just pass or fail, which was awesome because I've never experienced that before. So it was just such a great opportunity to be able to be in school, but living abroad as a student and experiencing the student life elsewhere was so special. Obviously like the student life in Montreal is amazing and so much fun. I know some people at least feel like, oh, I need to go to the 
States to experience like frats or I want to go here to experience more like the uni life. I definitely have experienced and continue to experience the uni life in Montreal because it's such a fun university town, but I wanted to experience living in Europe, just living in Scandinavia especially, and just experiencing university in a different way. Why did you choose Copenhagen? Everyone in Denmark was always asking me, oh, why Copenhagen? Like what drew you to Copenhagen? And to be completely honest, my first choice was London. I got Copenhagen, I don't know, by chance and because the universe had my back and knew it was best for me. I need to like go back to London and experience it well because my first time there wasn't the best because I was like depresso, but we won't talk about that. I got Copenhagen kind of by chance, but it was in my choices and for a while it was gonna be my first pick simply because Scandinavia has always intrigued me. The fact that they're so community driven, this kind of traces of the welfare state or more than traces, like this focus on the greater good almost, universal healthcare, free school, all these things, that really, really is attractive to me. Canada's pretty good with it, but I wish it was more like that where we are. London, Paris, New York, these are cities that I feel like are more accessible. Like if I were to want to move abroad, less daunting to move to London or to move to Paris. Then Scandinavia, it feels a bit more foreign because I'd never been before. And so I was like, if there's a time to like move there, it's now because when else would I think, oh, I just want to move to Copenhagen. It just felt less likely. So that's kind of why I picked Copenhagen. And yeah, like the fashion, the design scenes there are incredible. And I'm obviously super into that. So could you see yourself living full time in Copenhagen in the future? When I was in Copenhagen, I never wanted to. I like, I didn't want to leave, especially over the summer. It was extraordinary. It's a wonderful city and I love it so much. Full time, I'm not sure. I think that the winters there are not for me. If I was gonna live abroad, I would wanna live somewhere warmer, I think. Definitely gonna be somewhere I visit a lot, especially cause I have friends there now and all of that, but I'm not sure about the full time. Also, if I wanna work visa wise, very difficult to get a Danish visa. And then also the language barrier, Danish. I feel like if I was gonna work an internship or something, I would want it to be either in the world of film or in the world of fashion, like magazine wise and editing, that type of thing, like writing. And so I don't know if it would be feasible because I do not speak Danish. Although I've been trying to learn, but still I'll never be fluent enough, I don't think. I mean, not to jinx myself there, who knows, but so we'll see. But I definitely want to go back next summer. How did you find a com, a com oh my gosh, accommodation in Copenhagen through school, through the housing foundation? I stayed in base camp Copenhagen City, which was amazing location and a really good dorm, to be honest. I wouldn't recommend booking through the housing foundation. Like if I could do it again, I would just book it straight through base camp because the housing foundation fought me over and a lot of my friends too with like deposit stuff. I think they charged me like 80 bucks because I didn't turn off my freezer when I left. They charged me another hundred because I didn't decalcify my toilet, which is like you need vinegar and some like hard ass thing to do that. And I didn't obviously didn't have that. So just kind of like shitty things like that. And then every time I would forget my key, they would charge me 30 bucks to unlock my door, just like shitty things. So I wouldn't, I would book through base camp if you're thinking of staying there. But yeah, there are lots of student accommodation. If you're studying abroad, you will not have any trouble finding student accommodation. I think it's more maybe the price point. Yeah, it depends like what you're willing to pay, but there are so many dorms, so many options. How did you balance uni, work, and traveling? Like I said, grades did not count throughout exchange. So for me, school was non-existent until finals. The month of May was grinding most days to write my final essays and catch up on like all the that I missed, but for the first time in my entire life, school was not my main focus, which gave me so much more time to balance travel, work, and friends. To be honest, I think work also took the back burner because I was going through so much. Study abroad was a really big like reset in my life. It really, really pushed me out of my comfort zone. It was a very tumultuous time. I found it really hard to focus on work and even want to do work. So I think most of my exchange was dedicated to building relationships and like working on myself, figuring out what it is I like to do and my hobbies, what makes me happy because I was really unhappy for a long time. And so yeah, I dedicated most of my time to travel and to making friends. I think I learned a lot about balance in Copenhagen because people are so dedicated to achieving a good work-life balance. It's crazy. People take three weeks off vacation. My dad has always had that mindset of like, he loves his work, but he doesn't live to work. I've always had a very good balance in that sense in my family, but being in Copenhagen where it's the norm was so special. And I think it taught me a lot about prioritizing certain things over others and how to find a happy balance where I feel good daily. I realized how much energy I get from good friendship. Coming back home, I'm gonna have to kind of figure out how to find a good work, school, life balance because it is not easy and I do not have it figured out yet by any means. I think that there's always gonna be something that has to be sacrificed. You can't be perfect at everything and like still survive. I mean, I cannot. All that to say, on exchange, my top priority was travel and it was meeting people. I am a bit like disappointed or not disappointed, but I definitely don't think that I was thriving 
missing in my work but i do at the same time think i needed a break and now i'm coming back and i'm feeling good about stuff and more inspired more confident so yeah did you learn much danish from living there i did learn a tiny bit especially at the end because one of my best friends in copenhagen viola is danish and she would like text me in danish sometimes and teach me danish words languages has always been something i've been super curious about and i wish i could speak every language so when i was in denmark i was like oh my god i need to learn danish so i learned a tiny bit everyone speaks english so that's really not something to stress about yeah it's good i which is i love you that's the first thing i ever <laughs> learned i can like present myself meet noun at eva yeah eva from canada oh yeah and pesquita it's so hard but i love it because i love Copenhagen. Is Copenhagen expensive? I think this is like the most asked question relative to Montreal. I feel like yes. I'll just answer this by saying how much I spent monthly in Copenhagen. I'll give you guys a bit of a rundown. I feel like that's the most useful thing that I can do. Okay, so going out to eat in restaurants, I think the like cheapest restaurant is Fabro. You get pasta, it's 100 kroner, which is like 100 Canadian. Uh, 20 Canadian. Yeah, there's like fast food that's probably a bit cheaper, but even fast food is expensive. I think a burger and fries at McDonald's is like 20 bucks, so 100 kroner. So whenever we go out to eat, I don't think I ever spent under 150. It was like a cheap meal, which is 30 Canadian, but usually it was like 200 to 250 for a meal. You know, it's like $7 water for tap water. I think that that's like just something that you have to accept when you arrive in Copenhagen. It's like, if you want to eat out, it's hard to find cheap eats. You just kind of got to go into it expecting to spend. Transport, so if you're taking the metro, you're taking the bus, it's usually around 20 kroner each way, which is about four Canadian. So I got a bike for 150 a month, which was the best decision ever. Biking everywhere is so easy. It's faster than public transport and it's super fun. You have these dedicated kind of bike highways. So you feel so safe, so protected. I miss it already, it was the best. Then groceries were actually cheaper than Montreal, maybe because I go to like organic places in Montreal, but in Copenhagen, everything is kind of organic or not everything, but most things. So even cheaper grocery stores have great produce and stuff. I think I spent maybe like 17, 50 a month on groceries kroner which is like 350 or something because i was traveling a lot it's hard for me to get a good grip on how much i was spending but i did eat out a lot so my grocery bill was definitely lower than i think most people but it still wasn't very high i don't think in copenhagen there's netto there's super 365 discount those are like the cheaper ones and then i would always go to Fertex because i just liked it close to my apartment and i liked the layout i knew it you know when you know your grocery store you know where you can find everything that you want that was my relationship with that Fertex. so i just went there all the time and then like i think the last week i went to netto one day and bought the cherry tomatoes i would always get and they were like a dollar less there and i was like are you kidding me i was paying for the convenience i guess and then irma is like the bougie grocery store like 15 dollar toilet paper type b not really my jam but if you want Wanted, like nice chocolate or like nice something you go to Irma. Okay, my rent was 6,900 a month, which is about, I don't even know, like 1,500 Canadian or a bit less than that, 1,300 Canadian. Not cheap, but not crazy. It was a very small apartment, like tiny. I had my own bathroom, my own kitchen, but like it was minuscule. I was ready to move out when it was time to move out. I was really paying for location. I feel like the building was very nice. I was traveling a lot, so that definitely added to my expenses, but that varied so much, so I can't really give like an overview of that. And then I found that everything that I would buy at normal, so that's like the pharmacy, was considerably cheaper than back home. Like tampons, soap, everything super cheap. My phone bill was 60 kroner a month, literally free. Yeah, like museum outings, activities, usually like 100 or more for a ticket. So what was really cool though, was that with McGill, your tuition stays the same no matter where you go to study. So I was paying my tuition for McGill, even though I was going to U of Copenhagen, which is so nice because my McGill tuition is so cheap. My parents do pay for my tuition, so, and my rent actually next question i got was how much did one save before a trip abroad it depends so much on how you travel where you're going to be living i think that rent will probably be the biggest thing that will change a lot from place to place you know living in portugal or spain versus copenhagen the cost of life is just drastically different but i do think that any city can be made cheap like aside from rent if you grocery shop smart it's mostly i feel like with food that i spent the most so if you're able you know when you go out to eat and not get cocktail stuff like that i think you can save a lot how much did one save up before a trip it's too difficult I, I can't give like a number. How did you handle homesickness? How to cope with feeling lonely at the start? This was a very, very big part of the first few months of my exchange. I felt incredibly homesick, incredibly lonely. Like I'd never felt that lonely before. It was the most 
horrible feeling. I was not having a good time. Getting there in winter was difficult for sure. I'm a summer girl. The sun cures me and cures my depression. So getting there in winter was already brutal. I arrived in Copenhagen and was sick for about a month and a half because I was so anxious. And I think that also my homesickness just manifested itself physically, which I never really considered could happen or would happen, but it did. And it was like very difficult to be honest. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to see anyone. I was calling my mom multiple times a day. I was like laying in bed sick. I just felt so incredibly lonely. And then I was also planning a bunch of trips at the start, which was such a faux pas. If there's anything I can recommend, like give yourself time to settle into the place you're moving before you go on all these trips because I felt incredibly overwhelmed with all the trips that were coming up. And I know that sounds almost stupid because like how lucky was I to be able to travel? But honestly, it ruined my first few months that I was having trip after trip because all I wanted to do was stay in Copenhagen and give myself the time to settle down. I felt so depleted of energy. Traveling can be exhausting when you're not in the right mind, mind, mind space, headspace. I love traveling. It gives me so much energy when I go into it with excitement and when I feel good. But traveling when you're not in a good state of mind, when you're just like not doing well is the worst. And so the first few months of exchange, I found difficult. I was on the go nonstop. And if you watch my first abroad diaries, I do talk about it a tiny bit, but also like I didn't want to be too negative. So I didn't really dive into that, but I think you can just tell through the screen, even editing it back. I don't watch those videos because they just remind me of such a difficult time. But I do think it's important though. Like you can't only show the good stuff. How did I cope with that? So obviously not well at first, because like I said, I was traveling so much. I didn't feel like I had time to even cope or realize what was going on. I felt like distracted all the time. I think that it's after Portugal, like three months into my time abroad that I started slowing down and reflecting on what's going on. Why do I feel this way? I started talking to people in my life about how I was feeling and opening up a bit more. I started reaching out more, going out, doing more stuff. I actually made like that video doing a life kind of glow up. That was the month of May. And I really, really dedicated myself to changing things in my life, putting myself out there more, trying to make friends, pushing myself out of my bedroom, slowing down my pace, less traveling, all of that. I think that eventually the homesickness became less about being homesick and more about having to deal with the discomfort of not being in my comfort zone, if that makes sense. So it wasn't so much, oh, I miss my family. I did miss my family. I missed the people I had back home, but I think it was mostly like the wake up call of, oh shit, like I can't rely so heavily on other people to feel good, to feel happy and comfortable because I did. Coming to Copenhagen made me realize that because I was alone for the first time in my life and I did know people. I did come with some girls from McGill. So that was like a lifesaver to be honest, but I wasn't there with someone that I could just like really talk openly to. I didn't feel so that was definitely difficult. And I had to really push myself out of my comfort zone, reach out to people in order to find those people in Copenhagen for myself that I felt like I could talk openly to and confide in. And I ended up making the best friends in the world. I'm so freaking grateful. Once I embraced the experience and realized that this discomfort is part of it, that's when it started getting better. By being uncomfortable and like pushing myself out of my comfort zone, that's how I met people. That's how I formed a support group because friends are there for that. Was it difficult to be on your own in a foreign place? This kind of goes hand in hand with the other question. I have traveled solo. I always find it hard at the start, like arriving somewhere, but I do think that Copenhagen was the perfect place for me because I felt so safe, which is a huge deal for me. When I went to Paris in March, I felt so unsafe because I got full followed from the airport, shit like that. I would never have been able to do my exchange there just for that reason. That made it a lot easier to settle into life in Copenhagen, feeling just so safe. Aside from all of the anxieties I was experiencing and the loneliness, which are, I know, big things, I don't think that it was that difficult to be in a foreign country because I was in Copenhagen and it was just so amazing. The hardest part is just not knowing people, but you will get to know people by putting yourself out there and then it gets so much better. Were there moments when you wanted to go home? Weirdly enough, it's shitty as I felt, there was not one part of me that wanted to ever go home. I was determined to come home only once I had gotten the most out of my experience. And because the three or four first months were so difficult and not fun, I was like, "There's, I'm not ready to go home, which is why I stayed over the summer. I just, I wasn't ready to like give up, not to be like cheesy, but when I left for exchange, I kind of made myself the promise that I would come home a happier person. And I really wanted to come home new and improved. I had like two goals when I went on exchange or three. First was to become a local in Copenhagen. When I left, I wanted to feel like I knew Copenhagen like the back of my hand. And I feel like I do. I mean, obviously there's still so much for me to see and try and do, but I know Copenhagen quite well. Second was to make friends for life. I love meeting people, making girlfriends. There's no better feeling. I wanted to make friends that didn't grow up where I grew up, didn't come from where I come from. I needed 
newness. And then the third was, like I said, I wanted to grow. I wanted to find what makes me happy a bit more, get a better sense of myself. Before leaving for exchange, I had zero sense of myself. I realized that through exchange, but oh my God. Oh, and I forgot to say a big way that I coped with everything was journaling. And that kind of goes hand in hand with sense of self. And I'll make a video about journaling soon, but journaling really put me back in touch with myself. I used to be such a good journal person and I gave it up in the past year. I was really bad at journaling. I would only journal once a month to say I was depressed and then I would put it away. And on exchange, I got back into the routine of journaling and it really helped me build a better relationship with myself and get to know myself so much better and grow so much. And so those were my three goals and I think I really was able to accomplish them all. I think that's because I was on exchange for kind of longer than most people. I needed those extra months. The longer you're immersed, the more space you have for growth, I think, because I just didn't really see the end coming, if that makes sense. So I didn't feel rushed and I really took my time. How to make friends while living abroad. Two things, reach out and say yes. For me, reaching out it has never been easy. I hate asking people for things. First of all, that's like my least favorite thing. I never want to encumber anyone. I never want to be an inconvenience. I never want to be anything. But I think I need to get over that. I don't think that's a great mindset. Beside that, like I'm just not good at reaching out because I don't want to bother people. I'm always scared like, oh, imagine I reach out and they don't want to. Like, what are they going to say? Whatever, whatever. But I kind of got over that when I got to Copenhagen. I just texted a bunch of people. I was like, do you want to go for a coffee? Do you want to go for lunch? Whatever. I just kind of tried to put myself out there because what do I have to lose? Like, I don't know anyone in the city. And so I ended up going for lunch with Amelia. Really hit it off. I was traveling a lot, which is another reason why I don't think it's great to travel at the start because it makes it harder to kind of build relationships wherever you're living. But it took like maybe two more weeks until we went for dinner again. And then she brought friends to that dinner, Arlinda, Carla. Carla and I walked home that dinner, just started chatting. And she was like, you should come out with us with her group of girls. The following week, I was traveling again. But as soon as I came back, I texted her. I'd love to come out with you guys tonight. And I ended up going out with them that weekend, went to their apartment, prayed with them. It was the most fun. I met Katrina, Maria, Nine, Natalie. We went out to Museo, which became a staple for us. I mean, obviously there are many ways of getting to know people, but it's always easier at the start. You know, like going out and like preying, it just makes socializing so much easier, especially me, I get a little anxious sometimes. And I remember we all sat at their table in their apartment and they just like caught me up on all of what was happening in their love lives. And they really included me right from the start. I felt so welcome into their group. From there, we became all really close. That was like my kind of girl gang in Copenhagen. And we would just hang out all the time. I was always welcome at their apartment, all because I reached out for lunch and then just said, yes, yes, yes. It's always fun whenever people offer, oh, can I bring my friends? I always say yes to that because that's how I met my other super close friend in Copenhagen, Viola. One of my friends was visiting Copenhagen for the day and we planned to go get drinks. And then she texted me the night of like, oh, I met this girl on set. Is it okay if she joins? I was like, of course. And then we went for drinks, the three of us. After at the end of the day, I just asked Viola for her number. And then I ended up texting her when I was back from traveling. And I think we spent like two weeks straight every day, almost every day hanging out. We booked a trip to Amsterdam probably two weeks after knowing each other. It was just kind of like an instant connection. I just felt very comfortable with her from the very start. So you have nothing to lose, especially in a new country. How do you make the most out of the place you're in? First thing I'll say, I always ask for recommendations on my Instagram. I always do the poll thing and I go through every single recommendation. I'm a perfectionist, but I'm also, I'm a like obsessive person. I'm all of the above. I'm a bit like, uh, I don't know how to, I'm, when I travel, I want to make the most out of the place I'm visiting. So I do thorough research. TikTok, sometimes I'll check out if I'm like desperate. I like to find a bit like hidden gems and more local spots. I'm so lucky to have people who live there often reach out, which is like the most appreciated. But to make the most of the place I'm in, I always research and I make a list of all the places I want to go to. I did that for Copenhagen. I had an extensive bucket list and I ended up checking off so many things, a restaurant list as well. I'm actually launching my own Step account, but Step, the app is such a great spot to follow your favorite creators. If you see someone online that you think, oh my God, they travel so well, or they're always going to the coolest places, they might have a Step. Basically Step is this platform where people can like make steps of all their favorite spots in a given city. I have marked down all my favorite spots for Copenhagen, Montreal, Paris, London, Vienna, Prague, Florence, Capri, Lisbon, Barcelona, New York, Miami. Everywhere I've traveled to, I write down my favorite spots, my like hidden gems and stuff. It's at the link in my description. So whenever you travel, you can just check it out. That has become such a good tool when I'm traveling to find good spots. I follow Iris Law. She has such good spots for London. I know next time I'm in London, I'll be checking out her guide. And there's everything from restaurants to parks to hotels, coffee shops, vintage shops, thrift shops, everything. Things I wish I had known before 
moving to Copenhagen. I wish I had gotten a bike earlier on. And then the rain, everyone says it rains, but I don't think I really understood to what extent. It rains a lot. So be prepared for that, be equipped for that. If I were to go back to Copenhagen, I would definitely go only in the summer. I don't think that the winters are that much fun. Although people do make the best out of the winter. Hugo, why can I not say it? I don't even remember how to pronounce it. The winter is all about being cozy. There's all these cute coffee shops. People really make the most out of winter by staying cozy and stuff. Winter, I need to really learn to love. I need to get better at appreciating winter. God, my blister. If you could do it again in a different place, where would you go? Maybe I would go to Amsterdam or Stockholm. I would still have wanted to experience the Scandi lifestyle. Now moving on into more just like travel in general questions that I got. Most affordable places that you've traveled, anywhere in Portugal, anywhere in Spain, those were the cheaper destinations. Everywhere from accommodation to food to transport was always cheapest. And then Budapest was quite affordable. Prague as well. When I went last summer, we were all like in shock. We would go to like the nicest restaurants and it was still really affordable. I mean, there's been inflation everywhere. So like, I don't really know. We went from Paris to Prague and it was considerably cheaper. Is it hard to manage language barrier in certain countries? In my experience, no. I do speak French and English though. So I feel like there's some people always speak one or the other. I think the only like language issue I ever faced was in Portugal. It was a restaurant, but it felt like I was in someone's kitchen. Like it was very, not so much intimate, but it was only Portuguese people. No one spoke a word of English. Our waiter couldn't understand us. They didn't understand the Google Translate and we ended up ordering not what we wanted. That was maybe the worst experience, but it wasn't even bad. Like it was not that big of a deal. How to fight the fear of leaving the comfort zone. I always, always remind myself of how good I feel once I've taken that step outside my comfort zone. Even right now, like being in New York, I always get a bit anxious before traveling, especially on my own, but I always remind myself of how good I feel after I've done certain things that make me uncomfortable, especially when it comes to going to an event or a meeting with someone, always nerve wracking at the start. But then once you're there, you realize, oh, this isn't that bad. I feel the same with travel. If ever I'm feeling a bit anxious about certain elements of traveling, I just remind myself that any hiccups can be dealt with. Just think about how good you'll feel once you're there and just try to enjoy it and be in the moment, which is difficult, but you can do it. How to find authentic hidden gems while traveling. How do you plan your travel day itineraries? How do you always find good restaurants? I kind of feel like I answered this already, but check out my stuff. That's where I find my hidden gems and where I put my hidden gems, but mostly through people. How do you afford to travel so much and how do you budget meals and trips? This I think is the most asked question. That's like where I like to spend. I like to spend my money on experiences. My parents have always been big like advocates for travel. They know what you get out of traveling and they want to push my sister and I to do that. But it's not like my parents are financing my trips. I pay for my own stuff. Living at home, I'm saving quite a bit on rent, on like groceries and stuff like that, which uh, I'm so happy about. I'm never traveling with people who travel extravagantly, you know? So we're all always splitting either at B&B or staying in hostels. I enjoy traveling that way as much as I enjoy more like fancy stuff. But since I'm always traveling with other students, like we all kind of are mindful and money conscious budgeting is kind of part of it I don't think that any of us have this like strict budget but we're all thoughtful and I think a lot of people I've traveled with have the same priorities on what they want to be spending so usually going out to eat and activities okay how to budget a trip I think that the biggest thing to budget on when you're traveling is transport like take public transit when you're flying just take the under seat bag and then you don't have to pay for extra luggage when I was traveling with friends we would just like share closets and it was perfect so when you're not paying for extra luggage like a flight can be 150 round trip or 200 round trip trip or 300 round trip. I know some people did like overnight buses and stuff, which is a lot cheaper. When I'm planning a trip to save a lot, I always check Skyscanner on a private window, find the cheapest flights, and then sometimes I'll arrange or plan my trips around that. So if I find that it's cheaper to fly on a Monday or a Tuesday, then I'll just like plan my trip to be from those days to whatever days. When I'm flying somewhere, I always try to stay as long as I can because it just like doesn't feel worth it to me. Fly somewhere for like two days. For hostels, when I was interrailing, we stayed in hostels basically the whole time. We booked everything on hostel world two things i would say always book hostel based on location if you're far away you're gonna regret it and you're gonna be spending so much money just on getting into the city and it's just annoying also always read reviews we did not read reviews on one of the hostels and then we got there we were like oh my god this place is crazy the madhouse in prague i'm not yeah I'm name dropping. It was crazy. It was a lot of fun, but thank God we were four girls because if I had gotten there on my own or with one friend, I would have been so uncomfortable. It was like crazy. That was my craziest hostel experience. Also the generator in Paris. We woke up one morning to a guy doing you know what. In our room, we were like, are you 
joking. Thank God he moved out that day. Just know what you're getting yourself into, read reviews, um, but it was a lot of fun, but like, oh my God. One night I was sleeping in my bed. Actually, no, I was not because my neighbor was snoring. He was drunk, so drunk. And you know how people snore so much when they're drunk. It was just like nasty. And we were all texting at like three in the morning. It was a bunk bed. Christina was on top of me, or that sounds weird. Was sleeping above me. And we were all texting like this guy needs to stop. It's unbearable. So I was like half asleep and he gets out of bed, like tumbles to where my head is at, starts fiddling with my charger. My charger was like right next to my bed because like I wanted my phone next to me in this room. I did not trust those guys. He starts fiddling with my charger and I go, excuse me, that's my phone. Like, what are you doing? My heart was beating so fast. I was like, oh my God, this guy's trying to just steal my phone. He was so drunk. All he does is like grunt at me. He walks away and he lets one rip. Like I will never forget that moment because I could not believe I, it wasn't real. He was real life Shrek. It was disgusting. That was like my worst hostel experience. It, ugh, ugh, so gross. Back to budgeting on a trip. I think most of us had the same priorities. Try to travel with people who have the same priorities as you and same interests, because it just makes it a lot smoother and nicer, but we all loved to eat good food, go to museums and sightsee. So that's kind of what we spent the most on. And then another just money trick, I would really recommend getting a Wise card when you're traveling. They have the best exchange rates. It's free. I use Wise all the time. Even when I'm in New York, I'm using Wise. Small fees, like it's just, best. I really recommend. How early should one plan a trip, book stuff? As early as possible. I know some people are last minute. I was very last minute. It gave me stress for no reason. Although I will say like prices, sometimes you'll get lucky and Ryanair will drop a flight like two days before or like a week before and then flights are way cheaper or it's the opposite. Like it's really hard to gauge. I like to book early so that I can just rest easy. But honestly, when you're traveling in Europe, it doesn't really matter. You can book something super last minute and get it super cheap. Some people even travel without having stuff booked in advance and they'll book hostels on the go and stuff. Not for me, but people do it and it works out fine. So tips on traveling alone as a girl. So I've obviously traveled quite a bit alone as a girl. Be organized, know where you're going, where you're staying, how you're getting places in advance. I think that that's just the best way to kind of ease your stress and make sure that you don't end up having to like stay in a hotel. Just like know where you're going, be organized. Always be aware of your surroundings, which seems obvious, but like I've been guilty of putting in my AirPods and like kind of forgetting about my surroundings. That happened in Paris where I was followed from the airport and I kind of knew that this guy was following me i only realized towards the end and i should have realized sooner third thing is you have to walk around like you know where you're going act like a local act confident don't look like you're lost ever confidence people will leave you alone i just tugged at my earring like the hardest i've ever tugged at anything okay i did a quick outfit change because i have to leave but i will finish this like i was saying never look like you don't know where you're going because then you're just kind of like become the prey to certain people which sucks to say but it's true last thing how to plan an interrailing trip we took out a map of europe because that's where we wanted to interrail and then we kind of just like made a little loop. That's how we made our trail. I think that that's the smartest thing. I think URL even has a map where you can check like the big train stations. And then we bought a URL pass. There's a bunch of options. We got the five trips in a month option, which means that five days out of the month from the day you activate it, you can travel during the whole day on any train anywhere. Some trains require you pay for a reserved seat, especially like the busier ones. That's like maybe 10 euro extra, 15 euro extra. But other than that, I think it was like $300 Canadian for those five days of travel travel and then on the day that you're traveling you have 24 hours to take any train anywhere like I said which is really nice because it takes away the stress of what if I miss my train it's not like oh I miss my train I have to buy a new ticket it's oh I miss my train I'll just get the next one and then also a big thing just in general if you're not doing your rail and you're just taking trains I really don't recommend buying your tickets in advance because there are always strikes the amount of train tickets that I've lost and not gotten refunded for is like ridiculous I recommend getting to the train station knowing what train you're gonna take but buying your ticket on site or or like online right before do not book through rail ninja worst platform i've ever used go straight to the source buy your ticket at the train station if you can it'll be the cheapest and you are sure not to like lose money if ever something happens that way and then last question what are your future travel plans so i'm in new york right now but then i'm headed back home to montreal until further notice i need to study yeah i think i just want to do little trips here and there maybe throughout the year anyways i hope that answered all of your questions and was helpful i really have to run yeah love you guys